blessed Sunday to all of you. We thank God that um, just a few weeks ago, we were able to celebrate 60 years of God's faithfulness to our church. And as we look forward to the future, all of us truly want our church to continue to grow, to grow strong, to grow in numbers, to bring glory, honor, and praise to God. But we do realize that to do so does not just depend on one person, does not just depend on the whole pastoral team, does not just depend on even the, just the council of the elders or the deacons or the access leaders. It really depends on all of us, each and every one of us. Because when we do study the Bible, especially the book of Acts, we see that the church grew in par and was filled with the Spirit because people, actually everyone, was gathered in a place. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came and filled them, they were able to go out with power to share the gospel message to all the people. And many people came to Jesus because of that. And so it is our prayer that God would continue to bless each and every one of us so that we can become more and more like the, the Holy Spirit-empowered first century church as described in the book of Acts. Today, as we start on the new series on this book of Acts, we notice the purpose of the book is to give us an accurate description of just the birth and the growth of the church. And that's through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in truly committed disciples of Jesus, like you and I. And you know, although it depends, we can say it depends on us, but it really depends on us cooperating. The truly committed disciples need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and His power. Because God is such a gracious God. He has a plan for your life and my life. And he wants to fulfill that plan. That's the best plan for us, that we might be able to be strong in the Lord and to be strong as a church, to share his word, to bring people to him, to bring glory and honor to him. But the thing is, God gives us free will, and we need to cooperate. We need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I want you to use me. I want to be used by you in whatever way. And that is shown when we come to the Lord humbly, recognizing our need. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you. We, we ask for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. We ask that you give us your gentle light that we can see ourselves the way you see us and that we might recognize your calling in our lives and your love for us, that it might compel us to truly give our lives for you, to cooperate with your Holy Spirit, that we might be used by you in this church in Jubilee to bring glory, honor, and praise to you, to bring many people to the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be pleased. We ask that this morning, truly, you would open our eyes to see great things in your word, we might have the grace to apply it into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Acts was written by the disciple Luke, who wrote the book of Luke. And he says, in my former book, that's the gospel of Luke, Theophilus. Luke writes to Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Theophilus was... A Christian at that time, maybe a Christian, but his name actually means a lover of God. He might have been a Roman official who needed to know what the history of the Christian movement was all about and how it all started, and so Luke wrote to him. But whatever it is, the name Theophilus means lover of God. How many of you are lovers of God? Could you raise your hand? Do you love God? Oh, that's good. If you love God, if you are a lover of God, you will want to read the Word of God, 
meditate on it, memorize it, and apply God's word into your life. The, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, the disciple Luke wrote about all of the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day, verse 2, until the day he was taken up to heaven. And so the Gospel of Luke ends with a description of Jesus ascending into heaven in a cloud. After Jesus gave instructions through the Holy Spirit to all the apostles that he had chosen. Verse 3 says, after Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to his disciples, to many people at one time. He gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. And in verse 4, it says here, on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, Jesus was eating even though he already resurrected from the grave. He had a new resurrected body, which is able to eat with them, able to communicate with them, fellowship with them. Jesus gave this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here it is very, very clear what Jesus is saying. Do not leave, but wait. Wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, because in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is the promise that God the Father made. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 29, it says there, Afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. So God had already promised that one day, people who believe in Him would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened when we come to believe in Jesus Christ, right? When we came to believe in Jesus, our lives were changed because Jesus, through the Spirit, came into our hearts, came into our lives, and changed us. And so the disciples gathered round Jesus and asked, verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But notice this. The most important thing here is, verse 8 says, You will receive power. Acts 1.8 When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The word power there is the word dunamis, from which we get the English word dynamite literally means an inherent power, power residing in someone by virtue of its nature. It's the power of God, the power inherent in God. So if we have the Lord, if we have the Holy Spirit, then we can be filled with that kind of power. It's the Holy Spirit's power, it's not our power, to live the Christian life. It's ability of God, the ability, the power of God that makes us able to do anything, to be the persons, the, the lo beloved love, love, or, uh, love children of God. But the question is, how do we receive this power of the Holy Spirit? How do we receive God's power? First, we wait on the Lord, His supernatural power. That's our first main point. We wait on the Lord, His supernatural power. Now that we have the Holy Spirit residing in us because we're children of God, we need constantly to wait upon the Lord. We need to wait on Him. The word wait there actually literally means to stay around, just to keep on staying around, keep on hanging around, continuing onwards to wait. And that's what God wants us to do because many times, whether we like it or not, we're just too busy or too rushed? And how often do we really wait upon God's presence, wait on God? How often do we wait on the Lord? The Lord says, be filled with the Spirit. But how can we be filled? 
We have so many fears, so many worries, so many anxieties, uncertainties. The Lord says, be still and know that I am God. We don't want to be still many times, especially when we're worried, when we're rushed. We go and do many, many things to accomplish many things. But God says, wait. Do not leave. Stay. Wait. Wait continually. Jesus says, stay until you have been clothed with power from on high. How do we wait on God? Well, all of us have different personalities. Like I said, some of us get tense. Some of us get uh, feel rushed. It's in now, it's been said that successful people make a list of things to do the night before they go to sleep. That's very good because by writing things down, you plan for the next day, the things that you need to get accomplished the next day. And the night before, as Christians, we can give all of those things to God in prayer and leave them there with God. And actually, we sleep much better. But what do we do on the first thing we wake up in the morning? Do we rush away just to finish all of those things in our list? Or do we take time just to thank God? Thank God for a new day, for a day that we can breathe air, we can uh, live for Him again. Do we take time just to pray or just to read God's Word, take a verse or two, memorize it, meditate on it, and then take it with us throughout the day? Let's do that. Because Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If anyone remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you just cannot do anything. Do you need God's power in your life? We really need God. We can't accomplish much without God. Because without God's power, it may seem like it's, it's very difficult, especially in serving the Lord. But when we have God's power, we have what it takes to continue on. I wonder how many of you use wall clocks, just like the wall clock we have hanging right there. We use that in our homes. At one time, I changed all the batteries in, in, in our home to rechargeable batteries. There are actually three types of rechargeable batteries, the nickel cadmium, the nickel metal hydride, and the lithium ion. You know, when these batteries get used up, these wall clocks just stop altogether. And what you need to do is to change the batteries, of course. Unless you have batteries that are already fully charged, you have to wait until they're charged again. Now, some, doesn't matter how long you charge them, some require a fast charge of one hour, some maybe eight hours, some maybe 12 hours, Whatever it is, we have no choice. We just have to wait until the batteries are charged before we can use them again. Spiritually speaking, we all need to have our spiritual batteries recharged every single day because we run out of energy, spiritual energy, to serve the Lord, to live for the Lord. You know, in all the, all the temptations that we face every day, all the busy things that distract us, we need to come to the Lord to recharge our spiritual batteries. Wait on the Lord, His supernatural power. That's our first main point. It's just like some of us, before we go to sleep at night, we make sure that we charge our cell phones, right? But we need to make sure that once we charge the plug into our cell phone, that the other side is plugged into the wall socket, the, the power source. At one time, I failed to plug the power source, the charger to the power source. Next morning, I expected to use my phone. It wasn't charged. And I had to charge it. And this time, because I was awake, it felt like I had to wait even longer while charging it. Many, many of us just don't like to wait. And we pick the shortest line in the supermarket to pay for our groceries. And lately, when gas prices seem to be increasing all the time, when you know that gas prices are going up Monday nights, we don't wait until Monday night to drive the car to the gas station. Otherwise, you will have to wait long lines. We don't want to waste our time, right? We all know that time is precious. Money can be earned back, but when we waste our time, time cannot be bought back. It's wasted away. We need to wait upon the Lord. 
You know, some people say that waiting on the Lord seems like wasting time. But actually, it's not. Waiting upon the Lord, upon His supernatural power, is not wasting time. It's actually saving time. You know, how many of you drive cars? Can you raise your hand? I think a lot of you drove car, drive cars. I see so many cars out in the parking lot. Last week, I was preaching in another church. I came back before 12. The service was not yet over. And I had a hard time finding a parking space. Well, and um, how many of you use Waze while driving? Sometimes Waze can save you time. At one time, I failed to log in to, look at, to plan my route on my trip. And I, I, didn't, I failed to notice that there was traffic on a certain point, and I was caught in traffic, which I could have avoided if I just spent a little time logging in, opening this app, seeing where I should be passing. We think that we can save time by going, being rushed every single day, doing all the things in our list, but when we take time just to be with God that morning, just to give everything to the Lord in prayer, ask the Lord for wisdom, for strength, for grace, we can accomplish much more. That is my experience. I'm sure it's your experience too. Waiting on God is not wasting time. It's actually saving time. We need God's supernatural power. Let's wait on the Lord, His supernatural power. Because when we wait on the Lord, something happens to us. We are changed. Being in God's presence changes us. But we need to be quiet. We need to pray. We need to have God's Word fill our hearts, our minds, and our hearts. Knowing that when we come before Him, God is already there early in the morning waiting for us. And we just have to show up. We just have to say, Lord, I'm here. Love me, please. God is looking at us with love. He pours out His love towards us. If we have sinned, we ask for forgiveness. We receive His cleansing. And we, we receive His power to live the life for Him. You know, we're celebrating a great milestone, 60 years of Jubilee. And so we recount our history, where we had come from. Some, one person says, um, if you want to know where you're going, you need to know where you have come from. Do you remember how Jubilee started as a church? How many of you have visited the fourth floor of our Jubilee Center to look at the, can you raise your hand? To look at the historical um, displays, the pictures that were done very beautifully. If not, quickly go there while you can still see and read all those things that are happening. Or take a copy of the Voice of Jubilee and read it. Remember how, God's, how God started Jubilee Evangelical Church? It started with a handful of old ladies gathering together in a prayer meeting. Old ladies, fervent prayers of old ladies. Because when we work, it is we who do the work. But when we pray, it's God himself working among us. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. If we wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit leads us through the day, when we are able to yield to his leading, you know, the impact of things will be very different. It'll be powerful. One day I was waiting upon the Lord, and God impressed upon my heart to visit a certain Jubilee member. When I obeyed the prompting of the Spirit, visited the person, I found out that this elderly person had fallen, had slipped and fallen on the floor and was injured, and they did not have, he or the relatives did not have time or energy just to call the pastor to pray, which I encourage everyone to do, because how else will we as pastors be able to pray for you or even help you if you don't tell us what's happening? Well, because that visitation that day was arranged by God, both of us were truly encouraged 
because we were really blessed. And, and so every time, just before I need to visit someone, I would pray, Lord, who do you want me to bless today? Who do you want to bless through me today? Now, it's not me blessing the person. It's God working through me. And so I got to make sure that I wait upon the Lord, I receive His power that God can flow through me. How may I be moved by you? How may I be experiencing you so that I can be a witness for you? That brings us to our second main point, which is this, witness about the Lord, His merciful grace. Acts 1.8 tells us very clearly, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. That word witness there is the word martis. It describes a person who tells the truth about what he has seen, heard, and experienced. And um, that word, the English word martyr comes from the word martis and describes a person who truly believes what he has seen, what he has heard, what he has experienced so powerfully that he can't help but share it with others. And when he shares it with others, it doesn't matter if he has to die for sharing it because he knows exactly what he believes in. And that word, you will be my witnesses, the word witnesses there is a noun. It is a being. It's not a verb. It's a noun. Before we can do anything for the Lord, before doing comes being. Being must come before doing. We are, we are God's witnesses first, and then we can share about Jesus to others. So let's witness about God, God's merciful grace. The thing is this, without us first experiencing God, we cannot have anything to share. In order for us, for us to be a true witness, we need to experience God first. We can only be a true witness of our lived out experience of Jesus. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have received in our hearts, what has changed us, and what happens when we are able to share it with others. There's power there. After the pandemic, since the end of uh, last year, 2022, many people want to go outdoors for tours, either locally, around the Philippines, or abroad to other countries. I wonder, where do you plan to go this year? You cannot be a tour guide of anybody if you yourself have not been there before. Once there was a young man who went with some Christians on a missions trip in Taipei. The young man went with um, a group from another country. They were all students. And so they had to let, depend on the local guide in Taipei to get to their mission site. Unfortunately, they had a guide who had not yet been to the place himself. So while on their way there, actually some of them were already warned that it's easy to get a ride to the mission site, but coming home is a different story. You might have a hard time finding a ride back to your hotel. And that's what happened. They had to walk a long, long way back to the hotel. We cannot be a witness of what we have not seen, what we have not heard, what we have not experienced. It's not like tech transfer where you get a USB and you transfer data from one laptop to another. It's not just about transfer of head knowledge because you can get that all in Google. It's all about you and me experiencing God first hand in our lives so that we know exactly what we're sharing. If I have not experienced God myself, my sharing might sound empty, without power, and I might, at worst, sound hypocritical. Jesus said, you will receive power first when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses. 
How have you experienced Jesus? How have you experienced God's love, God's joy, God's power, God's love, God's joy, God's peace in your life? Can you share that with others? Can you witness about the Lord and just share about how the Lord has forgiven you, gave you second chances again to live for Him? This is how Peter experienced Jesus. The disciple Peter, after three years of experiencing Jesus, well, he denied knowing Jesus three times. And the disciples all went to hide into hiding when Jesus was arrested. Only John, the disciple, was there. And so, when afterwards, when Jesus resurrected from the grave, even though Peter did not, um, did not feel that he really wanted to talk with Jesus anymore, he probably felt like giving up on Jesus. He probably felt that because he denied Jesus three times, Jesus gave up on him already. But the resurrected Jesus came to Peter, forgave him, asked him three times, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And this, so this is how Peter experienced Jesus, a God who forgives, a God who gives second chances, a God who accepts the service, the love, the little love that he can offer him. And so Jesus gently challenges Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, and assures Peter of his love. Is this how you've experienced Jesus? How many times have you sinned against God, come, come to God, and God has forgiven you, gently restored you? Let's witness about the Lord. That's our second main point. Witness about the Lord, His merciful grace. Let's share how we were forgiven, how we were given grace to live a life pleasing to God. Almost all of us have maybe a family member, a friend, a coworker, an acquaintance who's not yet a Christian. Now, sharing the gospel with them might be risky. You might feel it's a little risky because they might reject you because they reject your faith. Or the gospel, we know, can offend people when they realize that they're sinners, they cannot save themselves. That's offensive. Jesus commanded us to share the gospel and there's actually no excuse for us for not doing so. So how can we be Jesus' witnesses? The most important thing we can do is first to pray for them. We wait on God, we pray for them. We wait on God and we pray, and then we witness and we share. We live a godly life in front of them, a victorious life in front of them, and then when they see that there's something different about our lives, then we can share our secret about this new life we've found in Jesus Christ. For those of you who have been worshiping with us before the pandemic, you know that every now and then, we have a group of old ladies who would stand in front and sing a Chinese song. Remember them? Um, we have two pastors there. One is already in Davao. Pastor Dorcas, but one is already in heaven. And I want to thank God for all their ministries that these people have done. Uh, Pastor Chi So Kun, who's already in heaven, used to visit the relatives of the members, of our members, who are not yet Christians. And together with some other old ladies um, who are very encouraged to go along, they would show concern they would build relationships with these people. They pre it's like preparing the soil, planting the seeds, watering it, and then God opens the door for us, for them to bring them to Jesus one day. And sometimes there was a time where I was asked to go, and it was like everything was prepared. Why? Because they loved the people. They already loved them. They, the people already felt, the person already felt God's love. And it was just like a harvest. The person was ready to be baptized. You see, this is what happens when we 
use the love of God, when we wait upon the Lord, His supernatural power, and we witness about the Lord, <clears throat> about His merciful grace, you know, God is able to use our love to bring people to Him. Our third main point, watch for the Lord, His Watch for the Lord, his imminent return. The next few verses talk about, verse 9 says, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. Okay. And they were all looking intently up into the sky. You see, Jesus went up in a cloud and a cloud. They were looking intently up to the sky. Jesus was covered with a cloud. They could not see Jesus anymore. Suddenly, two men dressed in white just stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why? Why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The disciples were there looking up into the sky and the uh, two men, two angels said to them, why are you looking up? Your focus should not be on the clouds, on the physical sign. Your focus should be on Jesus himself because Jesus for sure is coming back again. And so we are to wait. We are to watch for the Lord's return, his imminent return. How can we watch? The verse here in Luke chapter 21, verse 34 says, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. I wonder how often are you weighed down by the things in this life, especially this past three years? What are the things that weigh your spirit down? Be careful, the Lord says. Watch, because the Lord is coming very soon. The Bible tells us again and again, you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour where when you do not expect him to come back, be ready. The word be ready implies imminence. And the word imminent means likely to happen at any moment if it's impending. When we speak of the imminence of Christ, we mean that he could come back at any moment. And there's nothing more in all the biblical prophecy that needs to happen before Jesus can come back again. Throughout the New Testament, the church is told to always be ready. Always be ready. When you read, uh, when you study the word watch, watch, it means to be sleepless, to keep awake. It has actually two meanings there. Keep yourself awake, don't fall asleep, and keep yourself alert. Just don't get distracted. Keep yourself awake. The Apostle Paul says, you brothers and sisters, you're not in darkness like this day should surprise you like a thief. You're all children of the light, children of the day. That's our identity, children of the light, children of the day. We don't belong to the night, to the darkness. So let's not be like others who are asleep. Let's be awake and let's be sober. So keep yourself awake. Don't fall asleep. You know, some Christians are spiritually asleep. They are lethargic. They're unaware of dangers. What are the dangers? The dangers of imminent return of Jesus, where judgment will happen, where we will be judged right away. I remember during my first sabbatical in 2005, when all of my family members were in the car, I had to drive down from Baguio, where I spent my sabbatical for my doctoral studies graduation late afternoon, and then late that evening, I had to drive back up to Baguio to be on time for my youngest son's 
preschool graduation at 7 a.m. the next morning. Now, while driving back up to Baguio around 11 p.m., 12 midnight, <clears throat> while everyone in the car was asleep, I fell asleep for a few seconds while driving at 80 kilometers per hour. And when I woke up after a few seconds, I was gripped with fear, great fear, because of I was unaware of dangers. And I said to myself, this is never going to happen again. Keep yourself awake. Don't fall asleep. Don't allow yourself to fall asleep because Jesus can come anytime, any, very, very soon. His coming is imminent, and we have to be ready. Also, keep yourself alert. Don't get distracted. What distracts you from running the race, from finishing well in this Christian life? You know, we have this thing that distracts us all the time. Everything that comes up, especially if you don't turn off the notifications. Is it social media? Is it games, addictions, pleasures or pains, power, your success, your failure. You know it. God knows it. We all know it. Jesus says, be careful or your hearts, hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, carousing drunkenness and anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. At one time, someone said to me, Pastor, you should not be driving in the streets of Metro Manila. You should hire a driver. I wanted to say to him, but I enjoy driving until something happened lately. I was driving on a busy, um, busy marketplace. <clears throat> when driving, what do you need to watch out for? You need to watch out for trucks, vans, cars. You need to watch out for jeeps, tricycles passing, motorcycles cutting in front of you, bicycles, all of them expecting you to stop, and pedestrians crossing the street anywhere and anytime. Now, I had to turn left, so I had to wait. Where do you look when you want to turn left? You look left, right? So I looked left, I waited for the cars to pass, the cars to come passing by. I waited for the mot motorcycles to pass, the person to cross the street anytime, anywhere, right there. There was a person in the, standing in the middle, he didn't have a job, so he directed traffic and, would, and people would give him coins. So it was my turn after everything was done. It was my turn to turn left. So I started to accelerate. But out of nowhere, one tricycle came up in front of my right bumper. And I had no time to stop. So I was thankful to God, although, that the tricycle did not have his sidecar on the right side. The tricycle had his sidecar on the left side. So I did not hit the person's uh, leg. I hit the sidecar. And I was, as I was thinking about what happened, why did I not look to the right when I was turning left? I said to myself, of course not. When you're turning left, you look here. You look at the left. You don't look at the right. Then I realized that I was distracted. What was I distracted about? I wasn't using my cell phone. I know it's dangerous using cell phone. There was a time when I was using it when my car was stopped, but I didn't realize my car was moving forward. And I was so afraid afterwards. I wasn't using my cell phone. What was I distracted about? I had my mind on hurrying to go someplace. And so I was not alert. Keep yourself alert. Don't get distracted. Because Jesus can come anytime, his imminent return. When I was a kid, I remember we had a driver at home where we were all seated in the car. He would come into the car. Before he would turn the ignition on his car, 
he would do this. If this professional driver had to pray before he drove the car, then how much more do we need to pray? And so before we turn the ignition of the car, we remember to pray, God, I not only have to look right and left, front, look at this mirror at the back, I have to look up and pray. Watch for the Lord, His imminent return. Jesus is come anytime, any, very, very soon. The rapture is coming. When Jesus comes, we all know that we will see Him, we will become like Him, we will be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And we will be reunited with all of our loved ones who have gone ahead of us. And God will take us to be with Him in that wonderful place He's prepared for us. A place where there was no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. A place where we will be praising Him forever and ever. And on that day, we will receive the things due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So as we prepare, as we study the book of Acts, I hope that we can truly learn from the acts of the truly committed. First, we need to wait on the Lord, His supernatural power. His and second, we need to witness about the Lord, His merciful grace. Third, we need to watch for the Lord, His imminent return. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Let's come to the Lord and let's how has the Lord spoken to you? Let's respond to the Lord. How has the Holy Spirit, with a still small voice, said anything to you? How do you feel His moving in your heart, challenging you to do something? to be something, would you say to the Lord, here I am. I surrender my life to you. Whatever it is, ask the Lord for what you need to be able to obey Him. Now thank the Lord for hearing your prayer and granting your requests. Ask Him for grace, for strength, to be able to apply what He is saying to you. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the Word of God. Your Word is truly active, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We pray that you would continue to use your Word to judge our thoughts and attitudes of our hearts and help us to completely surrender to you, to your working in our lives, to cooperate with your Holy Spirit, to yield to you, Lord, forgive us for the many times when we're just so busy or when we rely on our own understanding and we don't rely on you in prayer. Teach us, Lord, to spend time alone with you in prayer, in your word, that we might receive your power, that we might wait upon the Lord so that we might be strong in the Lord. Father, Father, we pray and thank you that your grace will continually be sufficient for us. Your power will be made perfect in our weakness. Even as we surrender our lives to you, may you have your way in our lives. May we experience the power of your Holy Spirit. 
that we might be able to be living a life pleasing to you as beloved children of God, secure in your love, and willing to give up our lives to serve you, to bring glory, honor, and praise to your name. Help us, Lord, as a church, that we would know the importance of prayer to come before you to pray, not only for ourselves or our families, but to pray together as a church so that you might lead us and guide us to a brighter future for your glory. Let's all rise as we have the benediction. And now may the God of all grace grant you the filling of his Holy Spirit in you that you might overflow with the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord grant each and every one of us the time, the patience, the determination, the grace to wait upon the Lord, upon his supernatural power, that we might become his witnesses to share about your mercy and your grace so that we might be prepared any time for your second coming. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of our Heavenly Father, and may the filling of the Holy Spirit be with you all from this day on until the second coming of Jesus. In Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The service has ended. Let's spend some time with the Lord in prayer. Then let's go out and serve one another in love. <laughs>